Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and... Take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It is a free call, 1-855-450-NOAA. It's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour with me, my co-host, Steve Ovens. Welcome in, sir. How are you, Noah? I am in the middle. Let me walk you through something, Steve. I work in IT, right? Maybe. I think so. Last time I checked, I do. <laughs> and um, because of that, my job revolves around remoting into people's computers and clicking on stuff. I should be able to do that from anywhere I have an internet connection. Right, Steve? Ideally. So if I can do my job from anywhere, I question why I live in a place where I have a blizzard in the middle of April. Because that's what I'm going through. We're going to get more snow in the next 24 hours than has ever been recorded in the history of North Dakota, or so I'm told, if the predictions come through. The last storm that was of this severity was Blizzard Hannah back in 1997 when we had the, the, the Great Flood. Well, I can kind of answer that for you for sure. Uh, remember how you said that you wanted to uh, not be in an overly populated area? Turns out uh, <laughs> bad weather is often associated with not very populated areas. Yeah, because you can't be homeless here. You'll die. Yeah, so I mean, you want to go somewhere sunny and warm, that's where most of the other people are. So you, you tend to want to be, you know, homesteading out in the middle of nowhere while the middle of nowhere is going to be a little bit rugged. Well, I, I guess that's what I signed up for because, man, that's what I'm going through. So it started at like 1 o'clock. I walked into a client today. I knew We, we all knew this was coming. Like, this is a meteorologist. Everybody's talking about social media posts, whatever. Everybody's freaking out. And um, I... I generally take the attitude, like, well, I grew up in North Dakota. I'm used to driving where it snows, so I'll be fine. I get my car driver. One o'clock this afternoon, I drive over to a client. And it's a fairly busy client. It's one of those places where, you know, the boss, they, they're, they're all kind of working. And they're all working hard. And I walk in, and everybody in the whole company is standing against this wall. And I was like, Look, at what in the world? And I go over, I'm like, what are y'all doing? It's starting. What, uh, what is starting? And I, I realized they're all looking out the window and there's like the first few little snowflakes falling down. I'm like, you guys are crazy. That's just ridiculous. And whatever. It's a snowstorm. Big deal. So walk back. I get my work done. Get back in my car. Drive. About two hours after that, I needed to drive home. I live two miles away from my office. It takes me 15 minutes on any other day to get from my office to my house, get what I need and get back. I do that all the time. Today, it took me 57 minutes to drive from my office to my house and back to the office because there was a solid sheet of ice on the road and then snow on top. Absolutely ridiculous. So if you live somewhere warmer, if you're listening to this, and you live somewhere warmer or somewhere more pleasant, uh, send some good weather my way, I would appreciate it. Um, but yeah, let's get, in, let's get into the feedback, Steve. Let's, we'll start with an email from Jose. He writes in and says, Hey, Steve and Noah, now I, I guess I should preference... We did our last episode on the weaponization of open source and the decisions that some software uh, 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 software writers are ma taking a stand against certain geopolitical issues and using their source code and their projects to bolster their opinion. We got a lot of feedback on this, and a lot of it was very wordy, so we're trying to pick out the ones that kind of best summarize um, what you guys believe in what you've said. So this comes in from Jose. He says, hello, no and Steve. I just listened to your latest episode. And while I don't typically write into the shows that I listen to, I felt strongly compelled to make an exception for this week's topic. Excuse me if I come across as rather idealistic, but using a collaborative effort purposely harm others merely because they belong to a political system or government in disagreement with your own or for any other reason for that matter can never be considered acceptable behavior. Open source software is open for a reason. We write software because we want to, and we share it because we would like others to have access to it. This is done with the expectation of further improving the functionality or said software, at the very least making it more accessible to others. To take advantage of such a resource 
to not only harm those who happen to use a product, but effectively perform a terrorist act on an innocent civilian because of the actions of their government in reference to the Node IPC should cause such developers to lose any and all trust from distribution package maintainers, companies, etc. that may show interest in using their products. This sort of tactics only damage the reputation of open source projects. So uh, before we move on, Steve, I, I guess I kind of want to ask, because I, I'll be honest with you, when, when, when some of this stuff first came out, I took Jose's approach. I, I said to myself, this is not right. This isn't, this isn't how we react. If we really want to be inclusive and accepting of others and their points of views, then this isn't what we do. We just continue to write the software and we try to write the highest quality software possible and we let meritocracy take over and that be the governing ideology that moves software forward. We don't let political and social issues come into it. And your response was very interesting and, and, and you kind of took the opposite side of that. So I'm going to ask you, is Jose on to something here? Has he changed your mind or is there still another side to this? Well, I can see why people are upset about activism, right? I am not necessarily in favor of an activism, like any type of activism as a general rule. Um, I tend to lean very libertarian, which is, you know, I have a bubble, you stay out of my bubble. And the only reason that we might need a government or an authority figure is when your bubble intersects with my bubble and we can't sort it out between us. Um, and so I kind of take that approach. I, I, I accept the the arguments put forward in the email, but I still say that, you know, this, what you're, you are criticizing what someone else has chosen to do with their life. And I feel like at the end of the day, if it is a meritocracy, then this person has spent their, the merit of their project and you can choose to use it or not use it. And I don't believe them to be I think that terrorism is a strong word. I agree. And we, we had some other people um, explaining that, that same sentiment. And I don't necessarily agree. Like, you didn't have to use that thing. You chose to use a thing either in, inadvertently, right, because it was sucked in by some project you are using, or on purpose, in, in the case of a developer, by standing on the backs of somebody else. And, and didn't, and, didn't that, audit, and you didn't audit the code and you didn't pay anyone to audit the code. You just assumed and took. Even if you did audit the code, um, the idea is you didn't probably pay for it, especially in this case. And so there's there's this idea that you did something with your project that I don't like. And therefore, you shouldn't do it because it makes us all look bad. I'm like, there is something to that. I do buy that argument. I understand that bad apples makes everything look bad. But mm. I still fall down on the side of the individual here and say, like, this was their choice. They didn't do anything particular. Like, there's no illegal action happening. They, they stood based on their conscience, whether I believe in that or not. And you're upset because the way that they decided to express their opinion is not the way that you would like them to. Mm. And they use so, their project to do that. Right. I mean, I don't think that this is any different than any other. Like if you, Noah, for example, were, I don't know, if you're pro-life, we, we don't want to go too much into politics, but I'm just saying if you're a company because you decide the the direction for your company, if your company went out and said, you know what? Uh, we're going to allow our employees to go stand out and do a pro-life, you know, stand in the corner for an hour, whatever it is. Uh, that is your choice. And people don't have to use your company and they can be upset or not upset about what you do. And that is just this person's project is just an extension of the work, the labor that they are exchanging for nothing. Mm. They're literally getting nothing for this. One of the things that I've been working with my kids, um, especially recently, is time is the only thing in this life we can't get more of at some point. This person, these people have chosen to spend their time doing this thing, and now they feel compelled for one reason or another to take their time and do something that you disagree with. And now you're upset about that. 
I'm like, we need to t- take a step back and think about perspective here. It hurts. This absolutely hurts the individual. And I, I was the one that brought that up, right? I, this is just damaging the individual. It's not actually going to affect change. However, it is your choice to make your protest in this way. You know, I would add to that. I, I, I fight back pretty hard against this idea of it's just a tool. I, I hear that all the time. People say, oh, it's just a tool. Why, why do you let the software license dictate what tool you use? It's just a tool. It's not just a tool, right? They've it, like technology. And we're going to talk about this as we dig later on into the show. It's, it's becoming scary prolific inside of our lives and it's reaching in deeper and deeper every single day. And the uh, technology has very real interpersonal consequences to the technology we use and the choices we use with that technology. So technology in a lot of ways should be a reflection of your views and of your values and you should be making technological decisions based on values. Um, and so I don't think you should separate the two and I think the two are tied together. So this just expresses that same sentiment in a different way, you know, in a way that I might not agree with or might not care for, or doesn't necessarily reflect my personal beliefs, but I will a hundred percent respect the right uh, and, and privilege of the person that wrote the code and did the project to allow that project to be an extension of themselves and their views. I think that just kind of tie this up. One of the things that I I see when people are, especially this topic, talking about this topic is they see us all on the same team. That's not the case. Mm. We're a bunch of people doing a thing that scratches our own itch, right? And so we're not necessarily thinking of the open source movement when we, for example, relicense code, make something open core instead of open source or all of the rest of that sort of thing. And so there's this misconception of, we're all on the same team. So I understand that maybe in the quote unquote wider world, the um, they may see us all on the same team, but we can't treat each other as such because there was nothing, there's no binding agreement. There was nothing that said, Hey, you're writing open source code and now you must adhere to all of these things. We're just, we're just, we're decentralized and everybody has their own motives. And so, how That's about it. how about two individuals that write open source code? So two bit says in the chat room, Noah, on the flip side, if it's something for an open source library, they just use their project to sabotage your project. And now you have to spend time to either fork the project and build so that you can continue or you have to remove it entirely and find uh, a replacement of something that has the same functionality. Well, but that that doesn't make any difference so like we can we can look at for example the libraries that kde uses and how they've changed their licensing and how there's this big brouhaha in terms of the uh, the stack that they're using you know and they're they're doing it for profit reasons and all it takes like you can say oh well you know you changed my whole project and mm. that's terrible except that you've built you've made the choice to build on top of somebody else's work mm-hmm and when they when that is their work whether it's closed source like i can think about the for example something that you've done in terms of the microsoft api and they decide to deprecate that because you know they're moving forward okay but we don't hear the great out like the great outcry at microsoft and closed source software because they changed something that i was depending on right there's a sense of entitlement that comes across here like yep you chose to use something that someone else was giving you for free. Yep, a hundred percent. So, hey, you know what? We encourage your feedback. We like the discussion. It, it, it's what powers the show. Different points of views. We like hearing it, and we like having that discussion. So, you can participate at geeklap.ninja and join the interactive chat, or you can send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. All we ask is that you make your voice heard. Now, Baku did the same thing. He had a lot of uh, he had a lot of sentiments to express. A lot of these things, uh, I, I think, fit into to what we've already said. But then he kind of jumps off uh, in into a second subject here, and so I'm going to read that part of it. Baku writes in and says, "The Linux kernel itself comes with net filter subsystem that uh, can call a firewall of sorts by using trough-like 
t- uh, likes of IP tables. Is this still beyond the grasp of normal users? I recently discovered this application firewall that's easy to configure and use via its GUI packages for most Linux distributions. It's available and easy for installation. It's a port of a popular Mac firewall called Little Snitch. The firewall I'm talking about is Open Snitch, and I hope that at least a few listeners might find this application tip handy and useful. Here's a link to the GitHub repo, and he links to Open Snitch. So, Steve, you ever used Open Snitch? A while ago, I did. Um, I think this is a neat little tool. It's basically the. It gives you a nice view into what is doing what kind of. So I suppose I should say which application is doing what kind of connection on your system, and it gives you the ability to block or make some fine-tuned adjustments to it. I'm sure it's come a lot further than when I used it uh, a couple of years ago. So I, I had heard about this uh, from Jupiter Broadcasting. Chris talked about this way, way back um, when he was fiddling around with his Mac. Um, so I haven't, I haven't looked at this for quite a while. Very cool. Well, it's on my radar now, so I'll keep an eye on it. Um, and thanks, Paku, for writing in and, and sharing with us. We appreciate it. Jaron writes in and says, good evening, Noah and Steve. I recently was able to upgrade from DSL to Frontier Fiber. This upgrade provided the opportunity for me to use my own router. For context, I've been playing with PFSense and OpenSense, double netted on my lab network for at least a few years and thought it was time to put it into production. I set PFSense up on a spare PC with dual NICs. Oddly, I was not able to get a DHCP address on my WAN interface from the ISP. I did some basic troubleshooting, but ultimately came to the conclusion that PFSense was at fault. I was able to get a public IP on a separate Windows computer. It also worked fine on the original PC after installing OpenSense. I enjoy a challenge in considering that this is an interesting problem to solve just for the fun of it, but Googling for problems with PFSense DHCP yield useless results. My next troubleshooting step is probably Wireshark. I'm curious if you or any of your listeners have had any thoughts or to dig deeper in this PFSense DHCP issue and how to go about researching further. I'm also curious if you or your listeners have recommendations for other open source router software. Love the show. Thanks, Jaron. Steve, thoughts for Jaron on his DHCP issue? Yeah, I got, I have a few. Uh, so m- I, I initially missed the, the bit about him trying and working fine on OpenSense. So the, the response I prepared um, was basically like, hey, try OpenSense. Um, the reason for that is because OpenSense has a wider driver support, and I have experienced this myself. Before I got a Protectly box, I had uh, some Broadcom chips in my in my little, it wasn't a Nook, I can't remember what the brand is, but a Zotac. I had a Zotac box, and it had Broadcom chips in it. And I had all kinds of problems with PFSense that worked in OpenSense. Uh, so I, I eventually just, I, I've been using uh, PFSense for so long that I just didn't want to put the effort into to learning where everything was in OpenSense. So I just went out and threw money at the problem and got Intel Nix and considered it a day. Um, in terms of what other software you could use, there's things like Untangled for sure. Um, there's a few, there are a few Linux based ones. Untangled is one of them. Uh, and I can't remember. There's there's a couple of them out there that if you if you look for Linux based firewalls, you'll find them. Uh, I I still really like PFSense, but that's probably legacy since I've been using it. Oof, I don't know, better part of a decade. What do you think? I love uh, PFSense, and if I was making a recommendation, I would suggest. If you're looking for to stay within industry standards, I would stick with PFSense because there's a larger industry following than OpenSense. If, on the other hand, you're looking to do more tech exploration and kind of want to be on that on that uh, on on the on a more leading edge, I won't use the term bleeding edge, but leading edge, I might look more at OpenSense. You know, if you look back even over the past few years, right? Look at what happened with WireGuard. WireGuard comes out, it's great. It's efficient. It's fantastic. Everyone likes it. Everyone wants to play with it. Uh, It initially comes out for PFSense. Then there are some issues with it. They pull it entirely. OpenSense gets their act together, gets it up and running. Everything's great. It probably is another year before PFSense reintroduces a working version of uh, WireGuard back into it. On the flip side, when you go and deploy 
uh, we're working with a, with a client where they have a bunch of sites and we have to look at how we would manage all of these sites. Well, there are tools that allow you to centrally manage a collection of PFSense boxes. And there's a number of those tools out there. Now, is it possible to do that with OpenSense? Absolutely. Are there projects that do that with Ap OpenSense? Absolutely. Are they as mature and robust and uh, have a bunch of testing within industry? No, that's where PFSense kind of takes a leg up. You can order a number of boxes online from a bunch of different hardware manufacturers that pre-ship with PFSense. For the most part, I'm either buying OpenSense boxes directly from them or I'm going to have to load it myself. So it, it kind of depends on what you're looking at. As far as other things you could run, I might look at OpenWRT. They do have a port for x86, OpenWRT x86. Um, there's nothing in there that I would tell you, well, this is much better than PFSense and why I would use it. But I would say that it is, it's another option. So if you're trying to troubleshoot or, or, or look into what your options might be, you, you, you might do that. Um, as far as why you're not getting an IP address, uh, a DHCP address from your, 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 um, your ISP, a couple things you could try there. So if you installed OpenSense on the same PC and it worked fine in OpenSense and it didn't work when you installed PFSense, then this recommendation isn't, going to, isn't, isn't necessarily going to apply to you. But you might contact your ISP and just explain the situation to them. Hey, have a box, I've connected it, I'm not getting a DHCP. Can you see my box reaching out and asking for a DHCP request? And is there anything that's stopping that process from uh, successfully occurring? Because uh, we've had clients where they have, uh, I've had two situations that come up. So the first is, uh, sometimes ISPs will use a Mac sticky. So they'll learn the Mac address of the router that's connected and they'll pair it to that IP address and say, okay, so this is w what we expect from this client. And if you want to change the routing appliance, you have to call them and just let them know. Uh, other things I've seen is sometimes there is a limit on how many IP addresses they'll give out. So you plug in your OpenSense box, it gets an IP address. You plug in your Windows box, it gets an IP address. So you plug in the original router, it gets an IP address. Then you plug in the PFSense it doesn't get an IP address. Well, it might be because you've exhausted some sort of limit and just calling the ISP and saying, hey, can you, uh, can you help me out here? That might be your, that, that's, that would be my next step if, if I were troubleshooting. Um, in the time that I've gone through that, Steve has a couple more suggestions for you for some other OSs you could try. Yeah, so Shorewall and Smoothwall, uh, Untangle and ViOS. These are, I've played with all of these at some various points several years ago now, before I started at Red Hat. So we're, I guess we're going on six years. So I don't have any current information on them, but I know that Untangle was definitely the front runner back then. But uh, you might want to take a look at either Untangle or ViOS. So V-Y-O-S. Have you played with ViOS? It's one of, I've, the rest of them I have some experience on. Uh, I've not played with ViOS at all. I Like I said, I put it in a VM and went, huh, that's neat. I'm going back to PFC. <laughs> And been happy ever since. That should tell you something. That should tell you something, Jaron. Yeah, everybody that uses PFSense is very happy there. And uh, it's not perfect, but it's a nice camp to, to hang out in. Our third email comes from HJ. HJ writes in and says, Hi, Noah and Steve. I'm looking for an open source software to transcribe audio from video, similar to YouTube's show transcript. The idea is to extract the audio into text for ease of note taking from video presentations. I love the show. Thanks for your help. So Steve, you got any suggestions for transcribing audio? Not a good one. I cheated when I needed to do this. I wanted to <laughs> transcribe one of my audio books. Uh, and so I discovered that if you use the Google Doc um, dictation, like the little speaker, I just I literally put my my phone beside the microphone at my computer and I walked away and I came back like three hours later and it had done like 300 pages or something like that. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was free and it was close enough for what I was trying to achieve because I was trying to search around. I couldn't remember where it was in the audiobook that I was trying to find this certain stuff. And, uh, that was good enough for what I needed it for. Yeah. I, um, I, so I have a little bit of experience with, uh, with Simon. So if you're not familiar with Simon, you can learn more at simon.kde.org. Um, it works okay. Is the accuracy incredible? No. Probably Steve's suggestion is going to get you higher accuracy. Uh, and obviously with Google, it's constantly improving. The other thing I've noticed is with Google specifically, 
Um, my dad speaks with a slight Indian accent, being from India, and he has no trouble at all with the voice dictation with Google. Uh, frequently, if he uses other programs, it will provide some issues if there isn't some sort of training module to kind of learn the, uh, I don't know, idiosyncrasies, I guess, of his voice. So uh, my, you might check you might check both out and see what works for you. But uh, Simon is available at simon.kde.org. And obviously, Google, just log into Google Docs and you have the option to use their voice dictation. Um, we'll have links for both of those in the show notes. Our fourth email comes in. I'm gonna, I apologize if I mispronounce this. Is it Ishan? Ishan writes in and says, Hi, Noah and Steve. Thank you for the amazing podcast. Love the intro to the uh, Star Series. I had a question regarding backups. I'm looking into buying an external hard drive for backups, but I can only buy one due to a tight budget. I have some sensitive data that I would like to back up along with some videos and documents. My question is, is that possible to partition a drive and just encrypt one portion for the sensitive data? I'm new to the world of backups, so any advice or tutorials guides would be extremely helpful. Thanks again for the show. Cheers, Ishin. Um, Steve, can you uh, can you use Lux and make multiple partitions? Yep, you can use Lux to do that. Um, you can use Lux or you can look into... So friends of mine, they like to do just like a folder in their home directory. And so there's... Um, I don't know, ENCFS, it's E-N-C-F-S, and it allows you to do either just a, a folder or a, you can even do a single file. Um, and it works pretty well for them. They they store their sensitive information in that and they mount it into a, v a little bit crazy from my, my taste, but they, they have that and they mount it into a VM and the VM unlocks it and that's to kind of keep it separate from whatever cruft they have running around on their desktop. Whoa. Yep. So uh, with your, your favorite desktop, Steve, uh, with, uh, with KDE, it comes by default with KDE vaults. And vaults will either use IncFS or CryFS, and you can create a dynamic um, little container that you can store data in. You could also do it with something like uh, Veracrypt. Um, and one of the nice things about Veracrypt is if you need to bounce between platforms, you can get the Veracrypt software on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Uh, it also supports hidden part or um, excuse me hidden uh, volumes. So the way that works is you can create a password, and then you can create a fa fake password, and you put some incriminating looking stuff in your fake uh, password. And when if an attacker ever forces you to unlock your 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 decrypt your encrypted data, you put in the fake password, and the, the the fake data shows up. And they go, "Oh, look, we got in!" But actually, there's a hidden partition that has all the real data that you actually care about. Um, and what's nice about that is you can format the drive however you want, and then you're just storing that Veracrypt container in there. The other thing is, as Steve mentioned, Lux is perfectly capable of this. Um, you can create two in, two partitions and you could have one partition completely unencrypted and you could have the other partition encrypted. In fact, this is what I do on my, on my laptop. I have my, but the, the boot disc itself is encrypted. Um, and I have a little piece of Velcro essentially that goes on the back of my, uh, back of the, the lid of the computer and the hard drive that is clipped on there, half of it is unencrypted and it's for stuff that I'm just dumping in right and left. And then I have another portion that stays uh, encrypted most of the time. And the rationale behind that is recall that encryption is only protecting you when the disk is at rest and encrypted. If the, if the contents are decrypted, if you have the drive opened up, that key is stored in memory. And so if an attacker knows what they're doing, they can dump the key out of, out of your system's memory and the, then they'll be able to get access to the data. So, uh, for that reason, I would say that if it, particularly when you say that you have uh, data that you really want to keep private, if, if it's if it's very sensitive, I would suggest not only encrypting it, but always keeping it uh, uh, encrypted. The, the only other thing that you said, um, my uh, I mean, I'm new to the world of backups and advice. My advice is it it deeply concerns me that you are uh, talking about backing up your data, but only on one drive. Um, if anything goes wrong in your backup process, you're going to lose data. So if you could write in and let us know what the size of data you're looking to back up, I think we could probably help you uh, a little bit further. Um, so yeah, uh, write back in. Let us know live. At so Good. Good. I, I also do, I do this old school, right? I actually keep a zipped folder 
uh, that's GPG encrypted. I don't necessarily recommend that everybody do this because it is a bunch of extra work to have your GPG key and you unlock it and then you unzip it and so on. It's technically a tarball, but whatever. Um, it is a little bit more work, but that's what I do because I don't have, uh, I don't have tons of stuff that I consider that important. It's important, but I mean, at the same time, like, a lot of it are, are pictures and things like that where that's sensitive, but you can't walk around the world without having your picture being taken pretty much anywhere. So, I mean, aside from that, I know that you and I know I have the same approach of like, I'm going to have an air gapped yep. uh, thing. And so, yeah, if it's super important, it's on the air gapped hard drive that never touches the internet. And if it's not, then it's just you know, I have some stuff that gets synced around with, with Nextcloud that's GPG encrypted and then behind a password and so on. Yeah, the the, the metric, the, the question I would ask myself if, if, if you want to go the hyper paranoid route or just the, eh, it's good enough, is what happens if that data falls into the hands of whatever your worst enemy is? And if the answer is that is an unpalatable situation, I couldn't tolerate that, then I would keep it off the internet entirely. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't touch a machine that has, has the internet. If you say, well, I want to take reasonable precautions, but I'm not, I'm, I don't sleep at night with tinfoil wrapped around my head, then you're probably good if you're using some form of encryption, um, store it wherever you like. But yeah, I'd be pleased to write back in though. Live at asknoshow.com. I'd really, really, really like to know how much data are we talking about um, um, because we'd like to help you out further. And I think we can if we, I just need to know how much data you're talking about. Our fifth email comes in from Dave. Dave writes in and says, hi, Noah. Thanks for your show. I thought this might be helpful to you. There are GFCI style duplex outlets that have arc fault protection. You could turn off the circuit at the panel and install where needed. I've attached a picture of the outlet on Amazon. I want to let you know that I've enjoyed listening to you since the JB days. I have an Apple TV, the latest model, and it can't play the video version of the podcast, even though it's listed in the podcast app. I am thankfully able to play the audio version on the Apple TV. I really liked your explanation of why licensed ham radio or licensed radio frequency is so important. It was in the show where a listener wanted to control the release of seeds remotely from a helicopter. I'm a ham radio operator and an electrical engineer. I feel a lot of the makers out there probably benefited from that clear way you described the issue. Keep up the great work. You might want to consider adding a smoke detector to your charging station. The ones that have contacts close when smoke is detected. The contact could turn off the AC circuit and alert you to the house that there's an issue. Kitty has a SM120X module that can be used with a 120 volt uh, wired smoke detector. Sincerely, Dave. So. Man, do I like the idea of automating shutting off the AC circuit. So I I already have a Honeywell security system, and part of that is all of the smoke detectors uh, report back to the system and can tie into Home Assistant. So I already have the ability to take action based on a trouble alert. Um, I don't know how I would cut AC power. Is that something I would have to do at the circuit breaker, or would I do some sort of a smart outlet and then control it there. Well, so at least in this case, uh, you probably can't do a smart out. Well, okay. It depends on how you wired this. Mm. If you wired them in series and then your smart plug was upstream in series and you shut it off, mm. then anything behind the smart plug would, right. regardless of whether it's plugged into it or not, would not work because you've essentially broken the line. Uh, broke the line. Um, aside from that, I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to take a look into this, but I wanted to say thanks for the... I didn't realize that they had actual outlets with the arc fault protection. That's a good one. Like, you know, I still like having the arc fault protection inside the panel, but for this kind of uh, precision work, that that is a fantastic suggestion. Love that. I, uh, I have to look more into how I can shut the AC current da off. The other thing that occurs to me is uh, we're, we're talking about uh, arc fault and, and GFCI style outlets. Um, it led me down a different path last week. I was, I, I used to have a, uh, a type C outlet from Leviton has two outlets at the top and bottom that has type C ports, 45 watt uh, USB C PD on the side, love them, put them all over my house. My brother-in-law, who's an electrician saw that I put one in my bathroom and said, mm, don't put that there. You want one with GFCI uh, if it's going to be near water and inside of a bathroom. I cannot find a 45-watt USB-C PD outlet, so 
I'm going to throw out there since we've since it seems to have some discussion and some momentum and there are people out there that seem to enjoy or understand some of this. If you find a GFCI outlet that has USB-C PD, let me know. That in and of itself might be the better that might be the better mousetrap altogether with this charging station rather than using some cheap Chinese uh, six-way plug things and a bunch of uh, Type C chargers plugged into said Chinese plug things. I'm st stick with it for now, but if I can find something better. So I'd say um, you need to know the code in your own state. So for example, here, if you have uh, a GFI plug, so GFI plugs here have to be in any area where there's water. So a bathroom, a kitchen, like those sort of things. Right. However, uh, because the GFI should protect the entire circuit, that's what the theory is. Uh, you can get away with making sure it's the first one on the on the circuit, mm. and then it should pop all the ones behind it. However, I still went around and replaced like my bathroom had my bathroom and my kitchen were both wired with that idea in mind, and I still like nah. You know what? I'm going to replace all of these anyways. It's not that expensive. Yeah. Um, so I mean, your brother-in-law is not wrong. But if if the code allows it, you might put a GFI plug upstream somewhere so that it protects it, um, because then it would be a non-issue if if it's to code in your area. Yeah, yeah. There's only at the moment there's only one uh, there's only one in the in the house, but or in the bathroom, excuse me. But I could certainly add a second outlet. Um, but the the idea there is, I'm I'm a weirdo and I have a standing. Uh, stand for my laptop so when I'm getting ready in the morning I have eyes on on what's going on and breaking during the day uh, so it's nice to have a, I have a type C outlet in there then I can charge it otherwise I gotta have a little pop power brick our yeah. our yeah I know I'm, I'm weird our sixth email well, that's not really an email our sixth question comes in from the questions but hey did you know that you can participate in the questions but you can if you go to geeklab.ninja and message questions colon linux delta.com works over federation because we're on matrix and tiny asks he says I love the discussion about free IPA and single sign-on for a home lab. And I'm curious if either of you have had experience with setting up an OAuth provider like Keycloak or GoAuthTick.io. Setting up LDAP with Nextcloud and GitLab is easy enough, but I would like to use some of the multi-factor multi -factor authentication options available with OAuth and would like to know what your experience is. So I'll go first. I have none. Steve, your turn. Uh, yeah, Keycloak is deployed fairly regularly at... Red Hat. Um, so I have definitely installed and stood it up. It's one of those things, though, that I'm, it, I wish to get better at, but there's so many things to know that basically whenever I run into a problem, which is often, I just go, hey, uh, who knows this thing? <laughs> Let me ask you this. So it, I, in just kind of poking around before the show, yeah, Keycloak, you install it and it, it, it does kind of what free IPA does as, as far as central authentication? Uh, it, yes, but no. So this is a bigger discussion because there's a difference between authentication and authorization. And this mm. gets into like a security discussion and, and you have to know what the differences are in order to understand what each one of these, uh, products is designed to do. But you can tie Keycloak to an existing AD server. Yes. And again, it depends, like, because it has to do with, are you authenticating or are you, um, are you authorizing? Mm. And those are different things. Authenticating is like this person is the person who who says they are, and authorization is this person can do X Y Z. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, I would. You know what, Steve? I would like to pick your brain a little bit more and see if we can get um, some brain power that knows more about this, either from yourself or somebody else, and 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 dig into this. Uh, a little bit deeper. I would love to learn more about uh, central authentication, particularly ones that can replace AD. Cause I come across that all the time. Hey, our pick of the week this week is Deepin. It's not the OS specifically that I want to draw your attention to, but rather a feature that has come out with Deepin uh, 20, uh, the 25 release, and that is the ability to unlock the distribution with your face. So this is the first Linux distribution that uh, enables this out of the box, and they're offering a face-based biometric authentication method. It'll work on laptops with built-in webcams. Once you enroll your face in the control center, uh, you can then use your face to unlock the system going forward. Now, in, the, in, in researching this or in kind of looking in this, I also came across 
another article that describes how you can use facial recognition to sign into a bunch of Linux distributions. So you might say, Noah, you're talking about Deepin OS. That's the Chinese one. Were you aware of that? And I am. Uh, so you might not want to use Deepin OS, but you might like the idea of a face unlock. If you'd like to, there is a a guide that walks you through in a tutorial exactly how you can set up your face to unlock Ubuntu or many other distributions. And it's done with a, a, a software package called Howdy, uh, which is a Windows Hello styled facial recognition authentication system for Linux. I was not aware of Howdy, nor was I aware that uh, the Chinese were making such fantastic progress on recognizing your face and using that for your convenience. Um, but both will be available for you in the show notes at located at podcast.asknoahshow.com. Our gadget of the week this week. This is, again, one of my projects that I'm putting together, and so I thought I would share. So the goal here is I want to add accent lighting all over my house. I want to have accent LEDs all over my house, but I don't want people to walk into my house and go, oh, he bought sticky LEDs and stuck them up in a circle. I want it to look nice. I want it to look built in. I want it to look professional. And so um, the way I've chosen to go about doing this is with uh, is with a aluminum extrusion that I'm using as a, a, a diffusing cover. And so essentially what it does is it has it's a piece of aluminum and it has a uh, an angle on it. So you mount the aluminum to the wall and then there's like a 45 degree angle and it gives you a place to put your LED strip in there. Now I like that for two reasons. One is it allows the light to get a little bit more diffused and instead of looking at little dots going along the wall, it gives a nice wash of color going up or down, whichever way you do it. The other thing that I like is in my experience, LEDs tend to go out today, tomorrow, next year, five years from now, at some point they go out. And so you want a way to replace them. The putting them to an aluminum extrusion allows you to just go back and reach in there and pull the LED strip out and put a new set in. And then for the actual LEDs that I'm using, instead of using dumb LEDs, which I've done in the past, I'm looking at going uh, into individually addressable LEDs, which if I understand correctly, um, when this is all wired up and working correctly, I should be able to control the color and the on-off-ish-ness of the lights from uh, Home Assistant. And so I'll have a link for the exact LEDs that I have purchased and I'm using, as well as the aluminum extrusion that I am going to be using. Those will be available to you in the show notes at podcast.asknoahshow.com. From the Linux Newswire Newsroom, this is the Week in Review with JT. The Institute of Computing Technology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences has revealed the launch of the Beijing Open Source Chip Research Institute with plans to develop a RISC-V processor. Open Mower is an open source project to create an autonomous robotic lawnmower. Nebulae AI has released an open source library that they claim can run AI models 5 to 20 times faster. Nebu LLVM tests multiple deep learning compilers to identify the best possible way to execute your model on your specific hardware without impacting the accuracy of your model. Eleuther AI open sources a 20 billion parameter AI language model, GPT Neo X, which they claim is similar to GPT 3. Grafana Labs, the developers of the open source Grafana data visualization software, has announced that it raised $240 million in Series D funding. This new round of funding points toward a total valuation of the company at upwards of $5 billion. Cocos Technology said that it has raised $50 million to fuel growth in its open source Cocos Creator game engine. Cocos has been around for a long time as the foundation for making 2D games for mobile devices and other platforms. Cocos claims that it has been used by more than 1.4 million game developers, has over 100,000 games in app stores, and boasts more than 1.6 billion people playing games made with its engine. Aspire, the technology program management arm of Abu Dhabi's Advanced Technology Research Council, today announced that Open Robotics will be providing the open source simulator for the simulation phase of their Maritime Grand Challenge. For All Secure, a cybersecurity company formed in 2012 out of patented technology developed at Carnegie Mellon University, announced last week that it has launched a free version of its flagship product, Mayhem. In addition to a new $2 million incentive program, the new Maven Heroes program, as it's called, will provide open source software developers with $1,000 each to integrate Maven into qualifying open source software projects. Days after new open source kernel driver code appeared in the Tegra code drop, 
NVIDIA has published signed firmware images for their RTX 30 Ampere graphics cards. This will finally allow open source driver support to proceed for these latest generation GPUs. CIQ, the high performance computing company, and Rocky Linux's parent has joined forces with Google Cloud to provide customers with unified, best-in-class support of Rocky Linux on Google Cloud. Alan Pope, known by many as Popey, has released Unsnap, an open source utility developed to convert snaps into flat packs. The utility is still in its pre-alpha phase, but if you'd like to help in its development, head over to the GitHub repo. For those who have wanted to try Gentoo but didn't want to deal with compiling it, the Gentoo project has released a live CD. Endeavor OS, a continuation of Antergos Linux, has released its Apollo version and has included its lightweight WM called Worm. MX Linux 21.1 Wildflower has also been released. Tails 5.0 enters beta testing as the first release based on Debian Bullseye. OpenSSH has released version 9. So an article came out uh, this week talking about the FDA approval for Fitbit to detect atrial fibrillation. And I, you know, on the surface of this, it doesn't seem like it's any big thing. Apple has had this for a while. Google is just trying to catch up. But I think there is a larger discussion to be had here when you start looking at incorporating technology into your life to this extent. The data that's going to come out of this, where that data winds up and the consequences of it uh, can be far reaching. And if you're not paying attention to that at the get go, it might be too late. There are all sorts of reports of uh, companies that insurance companies very much want to get their hands on this type of data because it helps them predict where their true risks are. And if you want a, an, an immediate example of that, go look at these safe driving apps. Hey, just install this app on your phone and tell us where you are and how fast you drive and when you drive there. And then we'll give you a discount. And I use my air finger quotes there on your auto insurance. If you'll give us this data, it isn't going to be very long before other companies they're already starting, but it's not going to be long before many other companies start to request this data. So from the ARS technic, uh, technical article, which you'll find at podcast.asknoahshow.com, quote, according to a blog post from Google, Fitbit received clearance from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, paving the way for the feature to be deployed to the Fitbit wearables in the new future. Google cites data from a global disease study to state that atrial fibrillation affects around 33.5 million people around the world. Citing another study, it claims that those who suffer from AFib also have five times as much stroke risk as others. And so put, put basically the way that this works is when your heart beats, tiny little blood vessels throughout your body expand and contract based on the changes in blood volume. Uh, Fitbit's uh, PPG optical heart rate sensor is able to detect these volume changes right from your wrist. And then these measurements determine your heart rhythm, which the detection algorithm then analyzes for irregularities and potential signs of atrial fibrillation. So on the surface, this sounds like a great thing. Hey, wouldn't you want to know when you have this potentially life-threatening condition and would you want to do something about it? The question I have to ask back is, is it just you that is aware of that? Or is there somebody else aware of that? And if third party data doctrine law says that if I operate a service, I get to keep all of the data that comes into it and you don't get to tell me who I get to share that data with, where does that leave us in a world where we believe that we have these HIPAA privacy laws that come in to say that you can't share my medical information unless I give you explicit permission to do so. But now I'm giving you explicit permission to take all of this data because it's not really health protected data. It's really just Fitbit's data or Google's data stored on someone else's computer. Steve, you don't strike me as the kind of person that would jump on board with something like this. But I have to ask thoughts. Is this am I overreacting here or is there a serious privacy concern? I think that um, the large issue that we have with this or any other type of situation like this is we have a situation where in society we we often agree that we should set up regulations and rules for the people that don't have the wherewithal to either understand what it is or they don't have the time mm. or whatever but we're trying to protect the the overall goal of regulation is to try and protect the people that don't understand uh, the complexities of the things that are involved right because it's beyond them or whatever this this seems to me to be very similar. We've been talking a lot about 
uh, electricity and how that flows in your house and and how much regulation there is in terms of the national electrical code and in virtually every country there is some level of regulation around that because you know this thing can kill you it has it has some severe consequences to being mishandled the same thing should apply with this subject matter as well while it may or may not kill you to have your information leaked out the regulation should be put in place for the people that don't understand the issues at hand, like a manufacturer that is giving you a version of Android that's nine versions behind mm. uh, and will never be patched. Like there are people that don't, don't understand what that means and there should be regulation in place. And this is one of the only times I advocate for regulation, but there should be regulation in place for helping to protect the people that, that don't understand what they need to be uh, guarded against. So to your point, I work in a number of different medical facilities and I, as a, as a consumer of medicine, I've also seen in a number of different medical facilities that, you know, a lot of times they'll issue the little zebra handheld PDAs and every once in a while I'll pick one up and I'll just look what operating system is it running? Yeah. A lot of those are running on Android four, Android five. Um, I worked with a company that was distributing uh, portable handheld uh, mobile devices to patients who had an implanted device and needed to be able to communicate back. Went and looked at that. Android 7, Android 8, a little better. Not really moving the needle, though, from a security perspective. Um, it's terrifying. And as you so eloquently said, most of the people that are consuming this have no idea. They don't care and they don't know to care. And if they understood the consequences of potentially what they're up against, they might care more. But at the moment, there isn't really a financial incentive for a lot of these larger companies to make a change to be in, in benefit of the user. And so what you wind up with is you have medical devices that are made by a company in plant with closed uh, code that you don't get access to. The programming of which you don't get to see, you don't get to modify, you don't get to understand. It is placed inside of your body and then remotely connected to back to that manufacturer, that company, likely shared with your medical provider on a routine basis. And that device is remotely interrogated and you don't really get a say in that. Um, that is concerning to me and the direction that we're going is concerning to me. And really, I think right now is the appropriate time to speak up right now is the appropriate time to say no Fitbit. You don't get to detect what my health changes are until you're very, very clear with me on where that data is going, who owns that data, what say I have in who you share that data with and my ability to remove that data. If I ever don't trust you with it or if you get bought out or something changes, it's I just think that needs to be the case and right now it just isn't the case the music in our ears means we're out of time we appreciate you joining us we record this show every tuesday at 6 p.m central you're welcome you're encouraged we implore you to participate in the program you can call in on the phones you can send an email to live at asknoahshow.com but the, the, the function of the show was to serve the community to help you get your head wrapped around problems to that end we're going to be doing another community night it'll be the 5th of may we're going to do a focused community night we're working on getting some people from industry to come in and help solve some very specific problems people have been showing up and it's been a great opportunity and we think we can take it to the next level so we want to let you know about that join us next tuesday at 6 p.m central asknoahshow.com have a good week 